Hi, I'm Diane Gayhart, and I'm here with Dana Stone. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, my articles that came out in the July 2012 Journal of Marital and Family Therapy. And the topic was on the recovery movement and family therapy. All right. So why don't you explain to us a little bit about the recovery model in mental health? Well, most mental health professionals are pretty familiar with the concept of recovery in terms of substance abuse and alcohol abuse and dependence. And in recent years, there's been increased dialogue about the concept of recovering from severe and chronic mental illness, typically referring to schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And so the concept is that um, working with um, people who are diagnosed with chronic and severe mental illness, they prefer to be called consumers, typically more than clients or patients, and working with consumers to actually recover from these severe mental you know, health disorders that typically are often thought of as lifelong or chronic. So it's a pretty, and it's a very consumer driven model, not necessarily a professional driven model. Okay. So why do you think that marriage and family therapists and mental health professionals need to know about the recovery movement? Well, the recovery movement actually has a lot of um, third-party stakeholder support. Um, in 2004, the U.S. government and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services actually formally adopted a recovery orientation to treating severe and chronic mental health issues. And what's interesting is that many of us in the field you know, didn't get the memo about this. Um, and so it's something that, you know, mental health practitioners uh, need to be aware of because it's, there is a transformation happening across the country and actually it's a very international movement with Europe actually being much more on the cutting edge and Australia and New Zealand. And the U.S. is kind of following suit. So it's very much an international movement. Um, and it is the primary model supported by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So people who are currently working in public funded agencies are more aware of this and in California there's actually been quite a bit of funding for, to treat recovery or in, for treatment in recovery oriented programs and so actually in California the um, marriage and family therapy licensing law was actually rewritten in order to prepare marriage and family therapists to work in recovery oriented contexts okay. and just recently actually even the, li uh, the licensed professional clinical counselor licensing law was also revised so that they could work in these contexts. So it's going to be um, a new type of work environment that increasingly mental health professionals of all stripes, psychologists, social workers, MFTs, LPCs, will be coming increasingly in contact with. Okay. So is this recovery model a new theory? Well, what's interesting about the recovery, it's frequently referred to as the recovery model. Um, and when most mental health professionals hear about it, they kind of think it's like another mental health model like cognitive behavioral or solution focused or psychodynamic, because often that's how it's discussed. And most of the literature on recovery is actually targeting either case managers or program administration for mental health services and public agencies. And there's very little literature that actually targets these um, mental health professionals, such as a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker, an MFT, or an LPC. And so the recovery model is typically focusing on most of the literature has been written about how to deliver traditional services or you know, publicly funded services for the, to the chronically and severely mentally ill using this recovery paradigm, which really emphasizes um, that recovery means the person is living a fulfilling, meaningful life, whether or not their symptoms persist. And so, um, so it's really in dialogue more with the medical model than it is in dialogue with cognitive behavioral or competitor to cognitive behavioral or solution focused or systems thinking. It's really more in dialogue with the medical model. And what's, there are many, uh, like marriage and family therapy in particular, um, it is an approach that many of the theories that are associated with marriage and family therapy are more strength oriented, focusing on psychosocial functioning. And that's exactly what the recovery paradigm focuses on is 
psychosocial functioning of persons diagnosed with severe and chronic mental illness rather than the medical model that was really what's the frequency and duration of symptoms. And so this new model is really the question becomes, is the person living a meaningful life with or without hallucinations? You know, it's obviously recovery generally involves a reduction of symptoms, but it's not focused on symptom reduction. The treatment really focuses on helping that person achieve a meaningful, fulfilling life, meaningful, fulfilling relationships. So and there's actually quite a bit of, act of research behind it, and this is why it's become a very much an international movement. The World Health Organization from the 1970s and 80s that studied uh, initially uh, schizophrenia across cultures and also severe chronic illnesses like uh, mental health conditions such as um, bipolar disorder, severe and chronic depression, what they actually found is that about 25, roughly 25 to 27 percent of persons diagnosed with these severe illnesses um, actually had a full recovery, meaning their symptoms went away. And um, a sizable percentage, again, had social recovery where maybe they were, you know, on medication or receiving some sort of services, but they held jobs, you know, meaningful lives you know, had relationships and they were fairly socially functioning. And so, you know, around, you know, three quarters of persons diagnosed with severe and chronic illness actually were leading productive, meaningful lives. And so that's where this um, movement really comes from, is some international research around schizophrenia. There were even some studies that were quite controversial that actually showed that um, persons in third world countries diagnosed with, you know, schizophrenia in particular tended to do better than in first world countries where we put them in hospitals back in the, back in the day, we medicated them, and, and we cut them off from their social support. And we cut them off from being able to work and be a meaningful contributor to their community. And what we're finding is that is so important for persons diagnosed with severe mental illnesses to be able to be part of a community, to have relationships, enable to, them to work and such. And so there is, um, there is a body of research behind this. Another real exciting um, set of research comes out of uh, Finland with Jaakko Sekula's work on an approach called open dialogue. And Jaakko um, uses concepts from collaborative therapy, postmodern therapy. He worked closely with Tom Anderson, who was close by in Norway. And they actually have had phenomenal results working with um, psychosis and, uh, d and psychotic disorders. And they have this approach um, where they actually have a team of three professionals, a psychiatrist, a social worker, and a psychologist therapist of some stripe or color who go out, they work with the family, they collaboratively develop treatment plans. It's called open dialogue because a lot of the treatment planning and ideas about how to work, they sit down with the whole family or significant persons um, in the client's life and discuss how to move forward. And they've actually um, been able to have, it's close to 80% or more of their um, clients actually returning to full social functioning within two years, which is really phenomenal. And they actually have been able to uh, significantly reduce the number of chronic and severe cases of persons who actually eventually qualify for the schizophrenic di schizophrenia diagnosis because people do have psychotic breaks in Finland, um, but, uh, but they do not become chronic because of the way they're intervening. So there's some real exciting stuff going on in the area of recovery and mental health. So how do you think MFTs and other mental health professionals can take their current skill sets or knowledge and integrate the ideas of the recover model into their work? Well, I, you know, as discussed in the article in a lot of detail, a lot more detail at least, um, there's some basic principles of recovery and you know things such as the model is person-centered is what they call it and that doesn't mean that um, the consumers have read Carl Rogers research and they want us all to be doing you know person-centered therapy it, it's actually person-centered rather than problem-centered so they you know so there's the basic principle of the treatment should be focused on the human being the whole person um, rather than on the diagnosis and the symptoms and so there's a lot that we can take from our current body of knowledge um, in mental health and using that to, 
to help um, persons working towards recovery. And so in the part two of this two um, part series of the articles, I kind of, what I've done is I've taken some of the basic recovery principles and practices that are common in recovery, um, such as the concept of uh, recovery partnership is how they would think of the, um, quote, what we would call a therapeutic relationship in the recovery. The emphasis is really that the clinician, the professional, is a partner to help the um, person in recovery, you know, look at what their options are, make informed decisions, but it's really a partnership between the two. And they often talk, they talk, instead about treatment planning, they talk about recovery planning. So what is your recovery going to look like? You know, what do you want your life to look like um, when you're back to who you want to be? You have a meaningful life that's, that's rich and fulfilling. What is that going to look like for you? And how do we go from where we are today in that direction? And so the part two of the article, what I try to do, I, I use, uh, p draw from a lot of um, the postmodern approaches um, to come up with a model that can help guide mental health workers who are trained in, you know, marriage family therapy or, you know, counseling, social work, to use those theories that we do have to work in these new recovery-oriented contexts, which we're often even, the boundary issues are quite different, um, and you often aren't doing therapy in a you know in a room with a closed door, and it can be in an open context. You could be taking people, you know, to doctors' visits or whatever it might be. And so, hopefully, um, the part two of this article includes some of the more practical implications for working with um, persons in recovery-oriented contexts. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for introducing us to your articles. Thanks so much.